Um, anyways, welcome everybody. I'm Kyler. I'm the newest member of the .NET stack team, and I'm excited to be here. And um, so today we're going to talk about building modular applications, and we're going to we're going to talk about architecture and kind of some good architectural principles to keep in mind when we're building applications. And we're also going to talk about a tool called the facade, uh, the SSO facade, and we'll get into that a little bit later and, and we'll see how that can help us develop um, modular applications. So, um, and as we go through this, especially since there isn't a lot of us, I'd like to make this more of a discussion. You can say your comments, you know, but <laughs> just kidding. Um, but yeah, so I'll, let's just make it a discussion. And I think this topic can be a little bit controversial at times. And I'm going to try and avoid the controversy. Um, no fighting. Yeah, no fighting. But we'll see where it goes. And hopefully this can be a really insightful uh, forum for everyone. So to get started, I'd like to define some things as it relates to application architectures. Um, so up here, I've drawn a little line. And this is kind of like a spectrum on how we could architect an application. And there's kind of two ends of this spectrum. There's one end where we have megalithic applications. And I'm going to define what I mean by megalithic in a second. And on the other end, we have modular applications. So a megalithic application would be um, a single app that is so large and unwieldy and has so much stuff going on in it that it becomes difficult to maintain. And, and it becomes really hard to grow it. And um, so I'm just curious. I've, has anyone here ever worked on an application like that? Yeah? Is it, wow, I think everybody has. Shocking. That's the norm. That's the norm. <laughs> yeah. Anybody have any good war stories about that? I, I, one of my places that I worked at, it was, it was fantastic adding new features to this application. It would take forever to do it. And we didn't have very good unit code or unit tests. And so when we would add, when I'd add something new to the, to the code base, I was like scared, you know, like, what am I going to break? You know, my, and I would break things that I didn't even realize were related to what I was adding. Um, so anyways, this kind of an application I'm going to define as megalithic and kind of like the defining characteristic of a megalithic and I'm making up these words too, right? Um, is a megalithic application does too much, right? It's like all these different things are going on and it's all crammed together in one app, okay? So on the other side of the spectrum, we have modular apps. And a modular app is separated into multiple services or multiple applications. And um, you, you probably have heard a lot about modular apps. Another term for them, for them a lot of times is microservices. But these are applications that have, um, they're just characterized by lots of little pieces. Like, you know, you'd stand up just a part of the application that handles just one thing. And then you'll have another part that handles just another thing. And each of these different parts come together and you know, work as one cohesive whole, okay? So that would be like a modular application. And then in between these two different types of, and this is a spectrum, right? We can have, you can be anywhere along this line. You could end up being, let's see, you can end up being over here, you know, you could be a little bit over here or whatever. But somewhere in the middle is what I would like to term an atomic application. I've come up with all these terms, so there's probably no, you know, academic research or something behind these, but trademark, yeah, I'm trademarking these right now. Yes. <laughs> so somewhere in the middle is an atomic application. So an atomic application would be, um, it's a single module app 
that is it's carefully architected, it's well designed, and it has a path forward for growth. And it's characterized by doing one thing really, really well. So it's, it doesn't have lots of bloat in it yet. It's not, um, you know, it's not doing too much yet. So a good, ex yeah. Um, so these are all just kind of your definitions of these. Yeah, these are just, I'm, these are just more of concepts. So you and can't Google atomic application and get examples of what that would be like. You could try and see what happens. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but I may not be getting what you're describing. <laughs> right, yeah. And that's, that's kind of intentional. I'm, I'm more trying to get at concepts and avoid kind of any, you know, pre-existing definitions that we might get hung up on here. Is it just a, a statement of the reality of software that you keep saying yet? That, like, it hasn't gotten bad yet. It hasn't gotten bad. <laughs> Well, yeah, so I'm going to get into that in a little bit. But yeah, that's, that's a really good point. The reason why I bring it up is because in, in the front end, uh, the atomic design or the atomic the design factor actually is on the editor side of the spectrum. It's where you're splitting things up into as tiny pieces as possible. Yeah. So are you referring to like React and having components and things like that? Yeah. So, uh, and that's, a really, that's an awesome example of a really modular app. And if you think about it, even, even React with its components, they, um, the components all get compiled down into a single monolithic, you know, package. JavaScript. Yeah, gigantic JavaScript file that gets deployed. And, and really the component, componentization of everything in the front end is more of a... Um, like a best practice to help keep separation of concerns and things clean. So, um, and actually in this case, a modular app, specifically I'm thinking of like microservices where you actually stand up different servers that have just a little piece of the application on it and it runs completely independent of all the other pieces. There's a Kind of a small distinction there between those two things. We'll get into that some more. But um, so an atomic app I'm going to suggest is a single application that just does one thing really well. So an example of that would be a blog. You could have um, some software that handles a blog. You could make posts, and that's all it does. But let's say we wanted to add to our app um, a forum, right? So we could go into our blog and we could add new fields into the database to support this forum. We could add new business logic. We could add all these things. But as we do that, we actually start going from the Atomic app and we start going towards a megalithic app. You know, it, it starts getting too much going on in one application. And in that instance, it would, we could go towards the modular approach by creating a separate app that handles just the forum and then wiring those two things together. Does that make sense? Okay, so <clears throat> um, what I would recommend, and this is the gospel according to Kyler, is, um, that we focus, that, that it's okay to make atomic apps and it's okay to make modular apps, but we need to be careful about dipping into these megalithic things. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we can do that as we go along. Any comments, anything you guys come to mind? Any controversy yet? Yeah. What's beyond modular? Is that, the, is that the extreme? Yeah, those are called apps that don't run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Over here and over here are do not work. <laughs> like totally don't work. Or it is like uh, function as a service or... Oh, that's a really good... Yeah, so like Azure functions. I would say that those ones are over here modular and that, that actually might even be a little bit farther over here. You know, and like... And that's a really good, that's a really good way, thing to point out. You know, with 
Azure functions, for those of you that might not be familiar, are you can upload little like functions into Azure and then execute those functions as if they are like API endpoints and get back data and process things. They're pretty cool. Um, and those ones are like even more um, separated out from an app. Yeah. Just to tag on to what he said, I, I would argue too that you need to be careful not to go too far in the micro side, right? Um, if, if you do that too much, you can end up with something that becomes unwieldy to manage as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, because you have so little, so many little things that have, you know, it becomes difficult to manage. Yeah. So yep. You need to be not extreme either way. Yeah, I really like that point. Thank you. Uh, to this point, uh, there's a latency mm -hmm. associated with every micro app you have. And you start adding up uh, 20, 30, 40 calls to microservices, and um, all of a sudden, you have an app of calls. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on a little bit here. So I want to talk about atomic apps, these things I just defined or mentioned. Talk about some of the pros and cons of doing an, an atomic uh, app, as choosing that as your architecture. Um, so one of the nice things about atomic apps is that it's kind of like the natural our kind of instinctive way of building an app. And most developers have um, a lot of experience building this way. Um, and there's, here's a list of you know, some different pros there are to building an atomic app. Um, one thing that I'd like to kind of just focus on really quick is down here requires less resources and, and is cheaper. Um, with, when you're standing up just one application on one server, you know, it's just one app on one server. Um, if you split up into a lot of different microservices or in a modular fashion, you need to be conscious of the expense that that could incur because to have one app running, you actually need like four or eight or, you know, you could have a whole ton of servers that are running. And with an atomic app, you could have just one server. Some of the cons of an atomic application is that um, they, since they sit kind of in, in the middle between a megalithic app and a modular app, they can swing either way over time, right? And if we're not careful with our design decisions going forward and we don't put in kind of the time necessary to make sure we don't go into a, a megalithic app, we can very easily end up there. And that's how a lot of, um, that's how all of these megalithic apps that we've worked on get there, is that we just add a feature and we're like, oh, we'll, we'll, deal, with, we'll deal with it later. We'll deal with the um, adding it later. And so, so that's the main, the main thing to be aware of, is that when we create um, atomic applications, we need to make sure that they don't end up being megalithic ones. I think you have build and design as you go on there twice. Is that on purpose? That is on purpose, <laughs> yeah. The nice thing about doing an atomic app is it's, you don't have to have like a significant amount of design put into the app architecture beforehand. You can kind of just go by the seat of your pants, but that's also a bad thing sometimes. You know. We call it Agile? Yeah, it's called Agile. <laughs> <laughs> Two-edged sword. Um, so, uh, in my opinion, atomic app architecture is great. Having a single app that does one thing and is very cleanly written and you know is unit tested, has really good separation of concerns, that's a great app. And that is a really great app architecture to follow. Um, we don't always have to start off doing a modular application from the get-go, um, but be careful. We don't want to drift into a megalithic app. Um, so one of the challenges with atomic apps is this growth, and kind of we hit on this already. I just love that animation. Wasn't that cute? Um, they, 
as we, we start off with a core simple application and then we add feature and feature and feature and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Same with the database. They can just get really unwieldy. So we need to be careful with those. That's the challenge with Atomic Apps. Okay, so let's talk about modular applications, the pros and the cons. Um, probably you can guess like the, the, the thing that modular apps specifically address is this maintainability. When you have a lot of different microservices, the nice thing is you can then go in and replace you know, certain components, certain parts of it. And you can also reuse a lot of those different servers or applications for other projects. And um, modular apps are great for larger teams. Um, you know, for example, if you have a dedicated front-end team and dedicated back-end team, you might just start off having it split up where the front end is, can be completely deployed separately from the back end and same with the back end, that those two teams can work independently of each other. And, um, and then you could even split it up further from there. Um, and so it's, you know, there's a better separation of concerns. It's, it's nice, everything. Um, some of the cons are that it can be more complex. And so if you're just doing a simple app, um, you know, like you're a full stack developer, you're going to do the front end all the way through to the back end and everything in between. It might be, and it's not, you don't have plans for it to get super big or have lots of different people working on it. It might be overkill to do um, a modular architecture right off, right off the bat. And it might just make your life miserable. Well, not miserable, but more complex. So, any questions or any comments about that? I think to make a distinction here when we're talking about modularity, even in a, an atomic app or a single purpose app, we still write in terms of modules within the application. <coughs> I think what we're talking about here is modular deployments. Yeah. So, just, just to kind of make sure we understand that distinction. Yeah, that's a really good distinction. There, and I think no matter how you architect an app, it's always really important to have good, clean separation of concerns and code and everything, you know, best development practices. So if you're not sure on the right architecture, um, I would recommend that until you have a need for multiple modules, just start with a single module. So until you need to break it up, just start with a simple, clean app. Um, so yeah, there you go. Opt for an atomic app unless you know you need a modular architecture from the get-go. Okay, so let's uh, switch gears a little bit and jump into deploying a modular app. So let's say we've created our application or we're starting a new one and we've broken it up into a whole bunch of different parts. What is that gonna look like? So right here is kind of you know, an example architecture of what we might have going on. Uh, you've got the front end sitting over here that appears in your browser. Um, we have this gateway piece, I'm gonna talk about that a lot. And then we have some other different microservices or applications running back, you know, back behind the scenes. Um, the part that, that is really cool is this gateway piece right here. And this is kind of the glue that, pe that puts all of the, the different applications together. Um, we can use context path switching to say, for example, when we get a request that comes in on, into our application, uh, if it's a request to the root, we wanna get front end assets. For example, and that that then gets those requests get routed off to a different server, and then similarly, if we have the front end is calling an API, we could have that living on a different server, and those in turn can then call back further back end enterprise web services. Um, the distinction between an application service and an enterprise service, I'm going to say, is that an enterprise service is something that would be like, um, it would be something like our like uh, geolocation service. It's 
going to be consumed by lots of different applications and it's not specific to any one application if that makes sense or like a mapping service or membership data service whereas an application service would be something that's specific to my app like um, let's say well what's coming to mind is in our in our dotnet boot camp we have we walk through and we create an application that serves up uh, meeting programs for the ward right so in that sense we could have application services whose only job is to serve up these um, meeting programs. So those would be an application service. But calling some geolocation endpoint, those would be our enterprise services. Um, but so we, we break all that up and then the glue that holds it all together is this gateway piece right here. And we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about how we can, we can um, build this piece using the SSO facade and redirecting to all these different um, servers. This, this piece right here, the gateway, kind of makes all of our microservices behave as though it's one application. <clears throat> Any questions? Any problems? Awesome. <coughs> um, so when we do context path routing, um, one of the, the benefits is that each of the um, modules inside of the cloud of applications is given a unique route. And this eliminates cores issues that we could potentially have on the front end. And I've done a lot of front end development and that's very nice. <laughs> cores is like such a pain in the butt. Um, and then we can also create routes to modules that don't even exist inside of our cloud, you know, like enterprise services, or we could even use like Google API endpoints or anything and combine those into our application and make it behave as though there's just one app. It's pretty cool. Okay, so um, Cloud Foundry by default helps us out a lot with this. And I won't get too much into Cloud Foundry Rich is here, so he'll answer all of your Cloud Foundry questions. I don't know anything, you know, I'm just a noob with Cloud Foundry. But what we can do is deploy our app, and then we can wire that app to multiple routes. So this is an example manifest.yaml file. Hopefully everyone's familiar with these. But a manifest.yaml file is this configuration file for Cloud Foundry that we can drop into our, into our, visual, into our project. And then when we go to push it to Cloud Foundry, it tells Cloud Foundry, hey, this is what I want you to do. And so as part of that, we can define some routes. So in this example, I'm creating a My App application, or I've created one. And when I go to deploy it, I want it to be on the following different routes. So this one app, it could be a microservice, then would, um, be reachable with these three different routes. And so those three different routes could be little pieces of different um, application, modular application cloud things. Yeah? One the point I just one got you here. When you reference the build pack, make sure to put a version number on it. We had deployed a bunch of 1.0 applications that had been out there for a while, and we tried to restage them, and the restage failed because it was no longer supported in the latest version. Uh, and this uh, always keeps you on this version, so tag it with a specific version so you don't know. Thanks. That's a really good little tip. It's, it's <laughs> nice to always have the most recent one, but it's also not nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if your code doesn't change, but the build pack's getting pulled out from under you, uh, you can point it, you can, you can hard code it just to whatever is released with Cloud Foundry, but we release every six weeks as well. So if you, that's really good advice. Uh, Greg, if you just put hashtag then like 1.0.29, you'll always get that for Awesome. Cool. Thank you. The end of the That's a good little tip. Cool. Did you want to know about any uh, syntax bugs? It looks like you have some closing comment uh, ticks at the end of those. Oh. Your, uh... <laughs> Dude. Yeah. I pasted this into, into 
PowerPoint. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> Rob, does it, does it do checking to make sure that route hasn't already been taken? I don't know. Does it? If it's been taken, you won't push. Your push will fail. Okay. So if I have something that I put at the main domain, and then I have something else I put at slash API. It's, I think it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. I think it's all or nothing. I mean, how is it going to figure it out, right? I think, I don't want to, I think. That's what I'm wondering. You go to a push, and one of the routes is, is a, you know, a collision. I don't think it can. But so in, the, in, a, in his context, right, where you actually have the different context where slash is going to be my front end it's and still route. slash API, yeah. it'll figure out the two. You can still collide, yeah. So, okay. uh, yeah, if, if, if it exists in another space that you don't own, you won't, you won't push. So, so one other thing might be sort of point out here is while of course, can be a pain, and that course literally just like one line of code to turn it on, and it works. And then you don't have to have routes for every domain. Okay. What is it that you're referring to? Of uh, course, it's just one, one oh. line of code to turn on and that core, and then you don't have to do a bunch of routes. Yeah. And it actually, so another important thing to point out about using cores is that uh, browsers are limited to six concurrent requests per domain, so you actually extend the number of parallel requests by using cores. Cool. Of course, that all changes when HTTP 2 comes out, right? Mm. Well, HTTP 2 is out, but it has some security flaws, so it's not. Google uses it. <laughs> they don't care about security. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's next month's engineering forum. <laughs> security. <laughs> that even support anything but like, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so we'll move on. Any other comments or questions? Thank you for all the feedback. I think it's great. I, I think, you know, we, we had this conversation yesterday, and I think it's kind of important to, to talk about a little bit. Modular, modularization of applications, it's really good for us. It's really not very good for the client, right, the customer. So if you think about it in, this, in these, these terms, would you like it if your bank says, hey, we're modular, modularizing your uh, online login for, for your online banking. So if you want to check your savings, go to this route. If you want to check your checking, go to this route. If you want to make a payment, well, that's another route. They're horrible, right? You don't want to do that. You don't want to log into every single Strike different away. service. Great for them. It's like, hey, this is great. And this is why it's good for you, Travis, <clears throat> because you can still get into the savings and checkings when we pull the bill pay down to upgrade it. <laughs> is that going to make you feel any better? Not really, right? No. Like, I hate this bank. They make me log into like nine different things to do the thing that I just used to do when I logged into one thing. And so what this context path routing allows us to do is it allows us to keep our applications modular, modular like that, do these deployments in such a way that if I wanted to take down bill pay, I could take down bill pay, not affect the entire application, right? Because it's its own separate application. but to the front end, to the end user who's logging in, it feels like it's all one application. When I click on the tab for bill pay, it may come up and say, bill pay is currently not available because we're, we're upgrading it right now. But you don't get this all or nothing experience when, when you log into it. So what this context path routing is, is it kind of helps maintain that experience. There are other ways to do it. This is not the only way. <coughs> Cores is, is another way if you want to fight through cores, you can you can kind of do that. It's not horrible on the. It's really easy on the .NET side. A little harder on the JavaScript side to always get things just right. So, uh, not true. Amen. <laughs> but it's it's doable. I mean, we've worked through those things. We know how to solve those types of things. This is a nice, clean way to do it, uh, where you don't have to fight through the through those issues. But. Like uh, Greg says, some, there's, sometimes there's benefits. There's always trade-offs, right? Mm -hmm. There's pros and cons to each way of doing it. Well, yeah. so, so what you're saying, you know, it makes sense to have it, like, right, so if we had a large application, and if we modularized it to multiple front ends, then that makes perfect sense. But in terms of, you know, depending on the app, to have, you know, my front end and then have my API as another context, 
You could, because depending on how many web service calls you're making, if you split out the API side to, you know, api.myapp.lds.org, even if it's a different domain and you have you know, the course issues there, um, by doing that, you are able to increase the amount of simultaneous connections you can have. So yep. you can be getting your data on one bus and then getting your front end assets in another bus without them having to be at an or situation. I can have one or the other and wait for this to come down before I go get this. Another important thing to think about is when you log into like LDS.org, for example, <coughs> you have something like 20 cookies. Um, if it's on the same domain, all those 20 cookies are getting shuffled back and forth to your services yeah. that you don't care about. So if you turn on cores, you can still take your microservice APIs and you can put them all under one API domain, right? As you're suggesting here, just say on the front end, you may not want to be proxying all those requests. Yeah. So you're putting in an additional, potentially an additional hop, right? Plus you're taking on all those extra cookies and you're lowering the number of parallel requests. Um, so if you use cores, you increase the parallel requests and you drop all the cookies except for once you want, if you want cookies, but the services should be stateless. Um, and the only drawback is that you do have the pre-flight options, so the others. Yeah. And of course, we're, this is, it, it impacts web applications. When you talk about mobile, it's a completely different story, right? So. Yep. <clears throat> cool. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna move on and talk about um, the uh, stack facade and how this can help us. So the Stack Facade is this uh, tool that the Stack Team's written that um, helps us to emulate Cloud Foundry's proxying um, in our local develop development environment. So we can stand up multiple apps and then use the facade to tie all those apps together and then you know, effectively work on things in our local development environment. Um, and so there's, hopefully this link works. So on integration point, there's a document here. Um, Let me, okay. Oh, I was doing this to me yesterday. Okay, PowerPoint, hold on a sec. <laughs> So there's this document on integration point. Um, you could just navigate to it by, I, I just search in here and type in SSO facade or the stack facade. But this, uh, this document will step you through setting up um, the facade in your development environment and running it. And it's pretty straightforward. It's a really simple tool. And, uh, and we'll jump into that in a minute and talk about how to do that. And I'll show you exactly, we'll step through it and we'll set up a sample app really quick doing that. Um, yeah. So when we're using the facade, um, you can pass in, <coughs> when you invoke it, you can pass in a number of arguments on the command line and set it up that way. Or you can create a config file and name it .facade. Stick that in your working directory that you're going to call the facade um, app from. And then this is, this is a part of what that config file might actually look like. And in a second, I'll show you another one that I wrote. But basically, you're just defining inside of their routes and where those routes should point at. So you can, you know, start up if you're in, if you're using visual studio you can start running multiple different um, endpoints multiple different microservices and then glue them all together with the stack facade and then this will tell you will specify all the routes of those different parts how's that gluing it all together sorry what i just see a bunch of urls yeah there's a bunch of urls here I'll show you another a working one in just a second that'll hopefully make a little bit more sense. This one I just, you know, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and then there's a, a separate tool and 
Um, this one, we call it the SSO facade, kind of overloading terms here, but um, we've created, the stack team's created a NuGet package um, that is a lighter weight version of the facade tool. And this one, I'll also show this in a second. And this one, you can, you can import the NuGet package into your project, and then with literally two lines of code, you know, using statement, and then, hey, use the SSO facade, you can then emulate um, a lightweight version of this facade. And it will kind of help handle authentication. And it does everything except for the context path routing. And, um, and it's really good for the atomic application use case, where we just want to get up and running and we don't need to create any kind of configuration files. It just works. And it's a really nice, convenient thing to have. So. Isn't context path like kind of the whole point of the SSO facade? It is. So, so they're kind of, these two tools have different use cases. Um, this tool, the SSO facade, is more useful for just like a single app. You're starting a single app <laughs> and you want to um, add in the SSO stuff, single sign-on stuff. Uh, so basically it's an emulator. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep, there's a part to it that we get the WAM stuff so on. So this is where it gets a little confusing because we actually have, there's this thing, when he talks about like the stack facade, that's actually a node application that's running or, you know, it's a node server and it's a proxy server that proxies uh, those requests out and, and then routes them to the correct applications behind the proxy. So that's one thing that it does. Another thing that it does is it, it has the SSO facade in it, which is the emulator component to it. So stack facade, that, that node application, you can run it there. It'll do both of those activities in one. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a miniature megalith that we've written from the stack team that does two <laughs> things in one thing. So, um, but it's modular, so don't worry. Uh, but the, S, the .NET Core SSO facade is just a NuGet package that you can pull in. It only does the one thing, right? Just emulates, uh, emulates WAM. Okay, so just emulates this thing on. Yeah, so the confusion is in the naming. Cool. All right, so let's <laughs> jump into some code and work through that. Okay, so first we'll come over to integration point, and I'm going to just step through um, installing the the stack facade. And um, so first thing you do is we go and install an NPM package. So I'm gonna copy this command line or, um, call and open up PowerShell. There's PowerShell. And then just paste it in there and run it. I've already got it installed, but we'll pretend like it's doing it for the first time. So yay, now I've got SSO facade installed on my machine. <laughs> and then the next thing that we want to do is add in a configuration file. Now if we come over here and type in facade dash dash help, it'll show a whole bunch of different command line arguments that we can pass into it. Um, and I won't go into too much about what all the command line arguments do. You can read through them, and they're all they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, and down here at the bottom, it has a sample configuration <coughs> file that shows how to map things. So, um, yeah. So then, if you want to not pass everything in through the command line, and you want to just be able to execute, like type in facade and have it run, Next thing you need to do is create a .facade file. So over here in my project that I've created, I've added a .facade file, and here's kind of what it looks like. And um, I'm gonna focus on just kind of two lines here. Oh, I was like, where's everything? Okay. 
So this public URL is saying where I want um, like kind of the overall endpoint, what, what I want everything to combine into. And then I've got different URLs that will work with that endpoint. So for example, I have here a localhost.lds.org, you know, 8443/api. So what this means is if I were to type in localhost.lds.org colon 4000 slash API, it will then hit this microservice. And on my machine, I've only, I'm only going to start up one application, but I could have multiple other microservices. It would hit that one? This one? If I, so if I type in a URL that looks like this, and then hit slash API, it'll go to this URL. Yeah, why is that? Versus the other ones, how does it select which one is? Yeah, they have a totally different port number. Because the top one is the kind of considered the root. Yeah. Yep, so the top one is what everything is being based off of, and then it goes to these other ones. So the question sure. was, how, how would it hit like the second one? Yeah. Or the other one that's slash API. So if I yeah. did slash header, it's automatically going to pick header and LDS.org slash header? Um, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Do you want, do, are there any corrections? Am I teaching false doctrine? Yeah, you guys want to see what it does? It, it seems like maybe in your routes you want to pass, right? Where you tell what path you're mounting, which URL. I think the way, and I think Robert, when he wrote this, he just overloaded that URL. So he automatically splits that and pulls the path component off and registers that as a, a match. Um, so you could have separated that. You could have base, you know, base URL, and then you could have another component that says path behind that. But he just put, he just overloaded it all in one. And if you want to do that, because in this case, you've got um, your first one there has slash API and your Second to last one, slash API, so I'm not sure how you differentiate. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. This, I, I don't know. I think it checks, I went to the Java presentation on this. I think it checks the first one, and if it doesn't find a match, it continues down to the second one to look for another route that has the same route for it. So if there's a the match there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to run my app, and my app is going to start up onto this localhost.lds.org 8443. You need the 4000? Nope. 8443. So. So he's, he's, he's starting up one of the, the back-end services. Yeah, so I'm starting up the back-end service. Okay. I've got it by default going to Swagger. And I want it to, I want to make a route to hit this API slash programs endpoint. Um, and I can try it out right now. Hopefully it works. Yeah, it works. Um, and so this is, Right here is the actual endpoint that I want to hit. So if I paste that into my URL and I go to it, this is what I want to return from it. Okay. So now if I come over here, I type out my, now the SSO facade tool is actually not running right now. So I type out my config file, I save it, and then um, let's see, let's go into Program and then it's okay. So I have navigated into that directory that contains my facade file. Can you guys read that? Sorry if it's really small. So there's my facade file, my config file. So now if I type in facade, it will automatically pick up, it sees that um, facade file, the configuration file and then it configured all of these different routes. Now I've only got one of the you know, multiple theoretical apps running, uh, so all these other routes won't work. But if 
I come up here, and let's go to this first one. Copy this guy. So I copy that route, and then I go to it. Oh, I'm gonna open up a new. I'll just. I'm gonna open up a new session just so I don't have anything weird happen. <laughs> so if I go to API slash programs, now the goal is for it to hit um, this same endpoint that is on 8443. Okay, so hit enter and let's see what it does. Gotta wait for it to do stuff. Spence, it's killing me. <clears throat> Yay, there we go. So it worked. So I was able to proxy that request through port 4000 and go hit that program so that's being, it's being stood up on a different server. Does that make sense? Yay. Okay, and then really quick, we're like out of time, but I want to show one other thing. So I'm going to kill that, that process over here. I'll end that. And then I wanted to show off the, um, our own SSO facade light, I don't know what we call it, um, NuGet package. So come over, you can come over here and add in a new NuGet package. And you'll add in um, this lds.stack.securitycore.sso facade NuGet package. So once you've added that to your application, you can simply go into a place that you want. This is my this is a .NET Core app, and if you're not familiar with um, Core apps, I would highly recommend that you come to our boot camp that'll be at the beginning of the next year and you can learn all about them. But this is, the, this is actually the, the core app that we develop as part of the, the <coughs> class. And so you can go into the startup.cs file and just add in app.useSSOFacade, like that. And right now it, it wants me to do, to include the right using. So I just add a using to that NuGet package, and then that's it. Just hit save, and then when I run it, it will um, add in the SSO facade into my app. So now you see that it's asking me to log in with, you know, single sign-on before I go to those endpoints. So just want to demo that really quick. Um, I personally love how easy that is to use. <laughs> That's really cool. So any questions about that? I kind of just flew through that last one. Well, okay. I um, just want to thank you guys for coming and say Merry Christmas. And if you ever have any issues and you're like, Kevin, you feel like you're home alone, don't know what to do, come and contact us. We're on the second, we're on, actually we're on the third floor. Whatever. So we're on the third floor. Oh, no, go to the second floor. <laughs> yeah, shout at the ceiling. So thanks, guys. Thanks for coming.